Okay, now my daughter was teaching me how to do this. There we go. <laughs> um, okay, so I'm going to talk to you mostly today about circadian rhythms and then a little bit about um, my research with my longtime colleague, uh, Jay Dunlap. First, I wanted to um, give some thank you, certainly to Barry for offering uh, this opportunity for me to talk, although it's a little odd talking to people when I can't see anybody. Um, and in a different life, a different year, I would have flown to California because, and to Santa Cruz because it's my hometown and, and come and done this in person, but that's okay. Um, I wanna make sure that I point out uh, the Fungal Genetic Stock Center, which has been a very important part of my research life and also on the right, my three um, major funding agencies. Most of them have, most of my money has come from NIGMS, uh, which is part of the NIH. It's general medicine within the NIH. And without them, I would not have been able to be a scientist and have all the fun that I've had. And then I want to introduce my um, longtime collaborator, Jay Dunlap, who I met when I was a graduate student at Santa Cruz. He was a postdoc and we got married at the Pogo Nip Club. I have no idea whether that's even still there anymore, but I hope so. And that's a um, showing Dartmouth College here in the middle. Okay, so what are circadian rhythms and where are they found? Circadian rhythms or and circadian clocks are free-running sustainable oscillations with an approximately 24-hour period length in some aspect of biology. They are universally associated with light and temperature perception. Nevertheless, they don't change their 24-hour period length in response to light or temperature perception. Otherwise, they'd be a thermometer, right? You want something that um, maintains this 24 hour, whether it's very hot or whether it's very cold, um, so that you can tell the time of day. The perception of light and temperature allows um, the clock to be entrained to daily changes in the environment. So most organisms that have clocks have period lengths that are slightly different than 24 hours, but they but the daily turning, diurnal turning of the earth brings them into synchrony. So we all, all our clocks are exactly 24 hours a day. And we get reset every morning when the sun, when the lights come on and reset again when the lights go off. They operate within defined physiological limits. And this is kind of a, it's an easy concept, but we're not gonna talk about it. It just means that for every organism, um, your clock may work over a different, for example, temperature range. So in the fungus that I work on, it works from about 15 degrees centigrade to about 30 degrees centigrade. And I'm not sure what that is in Fahrenheit right now, but, um, and outside of that, the clock actually falls apart and isn't open. And that can be different for a different organism. Um, the period length, this last concept is very important. The period length of the rhythm is compensated against changes in temperature or metabolic, metabolic state. For those of you who remember your chemistry, that means it has a Q10 of about one. So this gets back to the thermometer, um, which has a Q10 of two or greater. A clock doesn't change in response to whether you're growing fast, whether you're growing more slowly, whether you're hot, you're cold, it stays as a clock. Okay. So this is um, a great example, sleep and activity in babies. This is a baby that uh, was recorded. I actually did this with both of my babies, but I couldn't find that. So I used this one from the literature. <laughs> it's buried somewhere in some file. Um, the dark traces are sleep. The white areas, let me see if I can find my pointer here. The white areas here and here our wakefulness in this baby. And this is from the first 11 days of life to 100 and I don't know, something. So you can see for the first uh, six to eight weeks of life, this baby just uh, wakes up and goes to sleep at random. For those of you who were parents, you remember this. 
And then they sort of, then they begin to get their metabolism together. And you can see that there's what we call a free run. They're not responding to day night, but they are waking at a certain time of day and then sleeping longer. And then about 16 weeks, they're organized. Their, their circadian rhythm is working. They can see the light and set their clock by it. And that's because um, infants, when they're born, they have a clock, but what they don't, the, the connection between the retinas, their eyes, and the area of the brain, which I'll tell you about in a minute, that controls the clock is incomplete. And so they can't um, synchronize their clock. Okay, this is Jerry Feldman, who was my PhD advisor. Some of you may know him um, at Santa Cruz uh, uh, from like 1979 or 1980 to 1984 when I graduated. And I trained in classical genetics with him, working on, um, the circadian control of spore production in Neurospora. So spores in a fungus, this type of fungus, are those fuzzy things that you find on your yogurt when you didn't open it up fast enough or you left it in the refrigerator or your oranges or your fruit. Um, for Neurospora, Jerry and others had worked out an assay where you could put um, the fungus in a glass tube here with ends bent up and medium on the bottom of the tube, and then the fungus would grow. And you put it in the absence of any light or dark or temperature changes in a chamber, and it would grow and every approximately 24 hours for the, the wild type for this fungus is 22 hours, it would make spores. And then it would not make spores. And then it would make these asexual spores again and on. And you can actually take pictures of these, what we call race tubes, and digitize them and um, analyze your data. You can tell um, uh, the phase when it peaks, which actually happens to be for the spores early morning, subjective morning, and also what the period length is between these peaks. And as I said, the wild type is about 22 hours. And what Jerry had done was mutagenize. This is a great classical genetic organism. He had mutagenized this organism and he had found short and long period lengths. So he had these strains with short and long period lengths. And I was involved with other people in the lab doing genetic mapping where we then found out where in the Neurospora, the fungal genome, these uh, mutations mapped. And we had found that they all, many of them, not all of them, but many of them mapped very closely together um, to a, an area that Jerry had named the frequency locus. Okay, so clocks are found not only in fungi, but they're found throughout the um, tree of life. So I'm showing just the top, uh, the, what is called the crown of the tree of life down here, if I'd shown you the whole thing would have been um, the bacteria, the prokaryotes, which the bacteria and the halobacterium and um, and they have some examples of circadian rhythms. Most circadian rhythms have been found up here in the eukaryotes, and those are the cells, we are eukaryotes. Those are organisms that have cells that have membrane-bound organelles inside their cells. So they have nuclei where bacteria, prokaryotes, do not. Okay, in blue is the different groups of organisms over the, um, uh, uh, um, uh, crown eukaryotes, and in green are areas that historically had um, a fair amount of research done on circadian rhythms, and, um, and so we knew that these different organisms had circadian rhythms, and then in red, um, including this bacteria down here, cyanobacteria, the blue-greens, I'm showing you where we know the most about at the molecular level, what happens inside the cells, no matter how big an organism you are, the clock is within cells. And we, in all these different uh, organisms, we know the most about the genes and proteins that put circadian rhythms together. And I wanted to bring your attention to this uh, little round red circle. This is why fungi have made such a great model systems. A lot of you probably have heard about yeast being a good model system for biological problems. 
if you look, you can see that the fungi here were the last things to radiate off the um, eukaryotic evolutionary tree before the animals, which is here. Okay, why are circadian rhythms important? Lots of reasons they're important. They regulate a lot of things, but, and the primary thing that makes them most important is probably daily programming. Um, they allow us to anticipate changes like light, dark, um, night's cold, daytime is hot, um, nighttime can be more moist, daytime can be drier, um, allows us to anticipate and promote coordination. So I'm showing a nice vineyard here. Um, and if what's going on in those plants? Well, it turns out that much of photosynthesis is circadianly coordinated. So if you measure um, carbon, uh, carbon dioxide uptake over the course of the day, and carbon dioxide uptake is done in plants, so that they can fix carbon into sugars. And if we didn't have them, we would be out of luck. There would be nothing on the planet to eat. Um, it peaks in the middle of the day, goes down at night, and peaks again the next day. And then this is measuring uh, stomata, which are the pores in the leaves, uh, in a plant's leaf that allows gas exchange. And the stomata open at the midday to allow the carbon dioxide in, they close up at night so they don't lose too much water vapor, and then they open up again the next um, midday. So you can see that these are perfectly in phase, as we call it, with each other. Okay, another thing that I'm sure all of you in Santa Cruz are familiar with is um, bioluminescence from the red tides that you get in Santa Cruz and elsewhere in the world. Um, and these are caused, caused by a marine um, dinoflagellate, a single cell organism called goniolax. And if you, you can take goniolax into the lab and put it in a flask in a dark chamber and then monitor the light output. And you'll get these traces where it peaks at night, doesn't make light even in the subjective day, even when it's in the dark, and then peaks again the next subjective night. And this trace runs for about 18 or 20 days. Okay, the second thing that clocks, uh, circadian rhythms are used for is photoperiodism. So this is mostly plants and animals controlling development based on length of day and night. So in animals here, in many, many insects, but, this, but photoperiodism is also um, found uh, often with big mammals like sheep or also little mammals like um, hamsters in controlling mating. Um, timing of mating. So um, when the days start to get short, um, that signals winter, like this time of year now, and both adult animals and um, uh, larval stages of insects can go into, will go into diapause, which I'm showing here with this little thing attached with webs. And um, and then as the days get longer in the spring, they can come out of diapause. And something that you're probably more familiar with, short day, there are many, many plants under um, short day or long day regulation. Poinsettias is what we're gonna start seeing pretty soon in our markets. And that's poinsettias don't bloom until they have a short day and a long night. On the other hand, you can have a long day and a short night, like midsummer, and that will promote things like California poppies to bloom as the days are lengthening. And the third thing that's in, uh, uh, that circadian clocks are used for is um, celestial navigation. Now, a lot of birds do this, navigate, and um, a lot of insects, like um, monarchs, navigate, which is probably the most famous example um, of celestial navigation. There's a guy at um, UMass Worcester, Steve Reppert, um, who has worked on um, the circadian regulation in monarchs for much of his research career. And he says that monarchs use a bi-directional time-compensated 
sun compass for orientation. What happens is that in the morning, when it's time to migrate, and I think the monarchs just, the last monarchs just left our garden about five days ago, they'll get up one morning and they'll take off and they wanna take off south. And they'll consult the position of the sun in the sky and their own circadian clock in their brain and fly off south. Over the course of the day, their clock in their brain says it's later, the sun moves, and they use that, they integrate that information in a compass so that they're always flying south. And so one of the fun experiments that people have done over the years is that you can put a butterfly that's migrating or a bird that's migrating in a, um, like a, a chamber uh, with no, uh, no light or dark or no temperature cues, it's just constant conditions and then give them a pulse of light in the middle of the night and reset their clock. And I'll talk a little bit more about uh, entrainment later. Reset their clock, release them the next day, and they'll fly off in the wrong direction. And before you feel too badly about them, the next time there's a light dark cycle, they will reset again and know which way is south. <laughs> okay, so a little history here. So this is the first documentation of leaf movement. Um, it was noted by, and I have no idea how to pronounce his name. I've tried it and I think I can, yeah. Andro Androsthenes, maybe, uh, was marching with Alexander the Great through the Middle East. And we're talking about uh, somewhere around 335 years before Christ. So quite a while ago. And he observed daily leaf movements in the tamarind tree tamarind. Um, and he, when they were home, he communicated this information to Theophrastus. Now, Theophrastus has often been called the father of botany. He was a student with and a colleague of Aristotle's, and they were quite close, apparently, and left many manuscripts that are still extant today. Um, Aristotle wrote a lot on zoology, and Theophrastus wrote on botany, or about plants. So this was documented, that the leaves of this plant moved. Whoops, no wait. But it wasn't until um, 1759, something like that, something like that, um, that a French researcher, de Marin, um, took a sensitive plant, a mimosa pudica, and put it in the basement in uh, mostly dark, and saw that its leaves that would open and shut in a light dark cycle continued to do so. So even though the plant didn't have light information, it, here again, we were in constant conditions, the plant, the leaf would open and close. Open during the subjective day, close during the subjective night. So, and he wrote that up, that's documented, and that is our, we consider him in many ways the first person to document circadian rhythmicity in the biological world. Many plants show daily movements of leaves. There is a guy that you can look up, Roger Hangartner at the University of Indiana, and he's made all these marvelous um, plants in motion, as he calls it, um, uh, movies of plants doing their circadian regulated movement. And this one of a young sunflower is my favorite. It's not just the leaves, but the entire plant basically does a dance over the course of 24 hours. So what you're seeing is the sunflower out in the garden over 24 hours and see how much it moves. Um, and some of this is in response to light, but most of it is in response to its circadian clock. It's dark, it decides to put all its leaves down and rest. <laughs> and then the light begins to come up and it gets ready. It anticipates the light coming and turns towards the light in the east. Okay. Sunflowers are really cool because they do this solar dance, but then once they flower, um, they stop their solar dance, just like a child becoming an adult, and they all turn east because that's where the 
best sun for photosynthesis, I guess, comes up in the morning, the sun comes up in the morning and they all face east. They'll still do some movement, but the more mature they get, the more they just face east. And it has been shown that insects prefer sunflower faces and other flower faces that are facing east to flowers that are facing in other directions. Okay, no more plants for I think a while or maybe at all. Um, so this is this, uh, a sepsis model in mice, using mice. And this is, this was out of an important publication. This is a very, very recent area of chronobiology or studying clocks, but it's very important. And a lot of people have jumped on this bandwagon. So you can see down at the bottom of my slide, this was silver et al, 2012, so only eight years ago. And they found um, that there was a receptor called a toll 9 receptor in mice that cycled over the course of the day. So the protein was there in the cell at one time of day and not there in the cell at other times of day. And this protein receptor is very, it's one of the most important things involved in your immune response. We have two big areas of immune response, the innate and the, um, oh God, um, Jay, innate, and what's the other one? Adaptive, <laughs> sorry. I think the, yeah, the innate is the one that happens sort of almost immediately when you're challenged with something a disease or pollen or whatever, and the adaptive is uh, then takes a while and comes up. And what they found is that they, and what he decided to do after he found that this important receptor cycled over the course of the day, is that they would vaccinate mice in the middle of the afternoon and 2 p.m. and then in the middle of the night. And these were mice that were actually being kept in constant conditions. So um, they weren't seeing light and dark cycles. They were just in dark constant temperature. All right. And then, then they looked at the increase in the um, adaptive immune system cells, the increase in lymphocytes and the um, innate, the, in, the immediate increase in cytokines. Um, uh, uh, um, anyway, it doesn't matter. Um, and how much there was, and they found that the mice, was, their immune responses were much greater when they were vaccinated in the middle of the night than when they were vaccinated during the day. Then uh, they were challenged with sepsis, um, a life-threatening infection. And then some days later, they evaluated how sick the mice got from sepsis. And the mice that didn't mount as good an immune response by daytime vaccination had much increased severity of disease and many of them died where the others um, were much less affected. So of course I look at this slide and I think, uh-oh, when do we all get our vaccinations? <laughs> but, so that's why this is, as I say, it's a very recent area of research. It's very important. I think we'll be seeing more of this. So now I'm going to talk about clocks in humans. Um, clocks regulate human behavior and health in a very, very big way. We're all familiar, I think, with the concept that jet lag is caused by dysregulation in our circadian rhythms. And most people think of it as um, because your body is now here, but your brain and your physiology still thinks it's here, um, that this is a problem with sleep. And it is partly a problem with sleep. Your circadian rhythms um, regulate when you feel sleepy, when, it's your, when your melatonin comes up in your brain, which helps with uh, sleep onset. Um, but it's not just sleep the body is regulated by circadian clocks by so many things so that you are really out of adjustment when you fly over several time zones okay so that's okay um so why is that part of it is because we don't 
adjust or entrain immediately. So the mammalian circadian system um, consists of, oh, so as I said before, every cell in our bodies, just like every cell in a fruit fly, for example, has its own clock or virtually every cell, there are some exceptions, has its own clock, okay? And clocks tend to cluster in the, like in mammals, they cluster within um, uh, tissues. So your liver clock cells all tend to be entrained and in sync with each other, but they may not be in sync with your cardiac cells, for example, or the cells in your epidermis, in your skin. You have a master area of regulation called the suprachiasmatic nucleus in your brain. And that consists of two clusters of about 20,000 neurons each. It helps regulate all the clocks within the body um, and it can entrain quite fast. So when you fly from one place to another, your brain actually begins to entrain quite fast and it does so by taking light information through your retina. It then travels over the optic chiasm. Here's your retina over the optic chiasm and this suprachiasmatic nucleus sits on top of the optic chiasm. And that photic or light information is passed off to these 40,000 neurons in your brain. So this area of your brain actually resets very fast, but then it can take many days for the brain to bring everybody else, pass on that information that we've changed locations and we need to start operating under our new light dark cycle um, to come into entrainment. There's also output um, and this is a lot of different things. Behavioral rhythms, sleep wake, feeding, fasting, locomotor activity, all sorts of physiological rhythms, body temperature, hormone levels, and very importantly, protein and gene expression, a lot of that. So this is sort of a fun thing to look at. These are just a few of the things that change over the course of the day in your body. And I'm gonna point out a couple of things. I'm gonna point out that between 8.30 and 10.30 in the morning, that's peak for heart attacks. Um, and that, this will be important in a couple more slides. I'm gonna talk about um, uh, 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 drugs for um, atherosclerosis and things like that, um, and when you might want to take them. This is a good one. Pain tolerance may be higher very early in the morning, 7 to 9 a.m. So if you're somebody that really hates going to the dentist and it's really painful for you, you really might consider making your um, appointments uh, first thing in the morning. Mm -hmm. On the other side, if you have a physical activity that you want to excel at, some um, you know, sport, you might want to time it for the time between you have best coordination from 2.30 in the afternoon, you're the fastest uh, reaction, you have your best um, cardiovascular efficiency and muscle strength um, up until around 5 o'clock. So there are a lot of things that you can time here or that are timed by your circadian rhythms. So circadian rhythms obviously um, are master overseeing regulation on things that happen in our bodies and in our different tissues. When they are dysregulated, we are finding out more and more about their involvement in a lot of different diseases. So this is also um, a big, big areas of research that people are trying to figure out. And I'm not going to go through all of these, but I wanted to point out cancer down here in the lower right. So if you have chronic jet lag, as you could think of it, if you're a shift worker, uh, if you're a nurse that works uh, shifts, um, you are, what you're doing is putting your body under chronic jet lag. And that dysfunction in your clock um, has been associated with various cancers. The World Health Organization now considers shift work um, uh, to be a carcinogen. 
Oh, and of course, um, anybody that flies or works on an airplane is, is uh, uh, very subject to that. Um, this is circadian regulation and sleep. This is, this is an interesting story that um, natural mutations have shown up in the human population that um, are mutations in genes that are involved in regulating the mammalian clock. And these people presented by either having a delayed sleep phase disorder where they don't go to bed until you know one or two in the morning and then can't get up um, in the morning. And so they're out of phase with the rest of the population or advanced, familial advanced uh, sleep phase disorder. Um, and these were tracked by geneticists to occur in families and eventually clock genes in the last number of years were sequenced and found to actually show mutations in, I think this is PER2 and this may have been CRY. Um, but this circadian regulation by natural mutations in families can affect things like um, when you're social and uh, when you operate in the world. So I'm not going to talk about any other of these, but it's but having a good circadian clock that you treat well is actually pretty important. So this is, I said I was gonna talk a little bit about um, drugs and drug timing. This is another very recent um, area that is um, a lot of people now are working on and I think it's very important. So as much as 50 years ago, the expression of a rate limiting enzyme in cholesterol synthesis uh, was found to be under clock control and went up at one time a day, down at other times a day. And this is in rat liver. Many years later, um, Atrovastin, was that it? No, Simvastin um, uh, was approved for treating hyperlipidemia and was prescribed to be taken once a day in the evening, originally based on, these, on this research. This was... Um, the first translation from knowledge of a circadian mechanism to a widely used me uh, medication. And this quote is from John Hoganesh, who works on, works on this. Um, we have somewhere around 2,000 approved drugs in the United States. Much of our genome is actually under circadian control. And I I'm speculating here, but I don't think it's... Um, too much to say that maybe half of the targets for these 2,000 approved drugs oscillate under circadian control, are there at one time of day and not another time of day, that's the targets, and yet we don't take our drugs at any particular time. So we don't know when they're most efficacious or when they could be doing us harm because they don't have a target. So this is what people are working on, the best targets and times for treatment in the context of disease needs to be determined empirically. This looks like a busy slide, but it's not. Just look at the blue and the red. These are the few areas of drugs that we do know, and you will, when they're prescribed to you, your physician should be telling you to take them either in the morning or the evening. Now, heartburn meds we take in the morning, the proton pump inhibitors. Um, and you wanna take it before breakfast, let it settle into your stomach, because when you eat, you produce stomach acid and the acid is what activates the proton pump inhibitor. So then you get it right before you eat um, and it is active then for the next 12 hours or until you go into your fasting at night and you're not eating. Diuretics, water pills have also now been for quite a while prescribed to take in the morning. And that's more for convenience because of course they treat high blood pressure. They cause increased salt excretion and um, importantly for convenience, urination. So if you take them at night, you just have to get up and go to the bathroom more at night. And so for quite a while now, physicians have been saying to take them in the morning. But a huge study, like 20,000 participants in Spain, just came out last year. <laughs> Hello? Okay. Um, and that now shows that hypertension meds should all be taken at bedtime. 
and it may do as much as half the risk for heart attack, stroke, or heart failure because it keeps your blood pressure lower around the clock if you take them at night. So I don't know about this. I think this is one of the things that people have to think about, physicians have to think about and resolve. Um, then we have our statins, which many of us take. Um, we um, um, take these at night um, because the cholesterol synthesis actually happens most at night and not during the morning or during the daytime. And same for H2 blockers, the nighttime heartburn or heartburn meds. Um, we produce two to three times as much acid in our stomach at night than we do during the day. So it makes sense to take those um, at night. Okay, so in my remaining time, and I have a few more slides to show you, but not too, too many, I'm gonna talk about um, my own work and uh, my work with Jay. And so understanding how clocks work requires determining what you want to know. And this is true for any uh, scientist setting out on a course of research. You have to figure out um, what you want to know. And when I say everything, when Jay and I were young, we wanted to know everything, but we wanted to know it at the molecular level because when we started, nobody knew anything about the genes and proteins that um, put together circadian systems, not, um, not the uh, input or output or the clock itself. So I'm gonna attribute this. This is Woody Hastings down at the bottom, a just lovely man who was um, Jay's PhD advisor at Harvard. And setting out this three big questions in clocks um, is attributed to Woody. Um, and I'm showing here input, the oscillator itself, which were for many, many, many years was considered a complete molecular back black box and output, and we've talked about input, oscillator, and output so far. Um, so input is things like light, or changes in temperature, or behavioral activity in uh, more sophisticated organisms like mammals um, can actually reset your clock. And the oscillator in here is this self-sustained endogenous molecular clockworks that, um, and we wanted to know the gears and how they were put together and assembled. Um, and then output. You have all this rhythmic biology in metabolism and behavior and so much. How does the clock tell the rest of the organism what time of day it is? How does this work? So then you pick your research question and then you pick your system or organism that you think will be the best thing to work with to give you answers to what you want to know. So I'm showing you some pretty pictures here of our research organism, which has also been Barry Bowman's research organism. It's probably why we like each other so much. <laughs> um, it's Neurospora crassa, and it's been a genetic research organism since the 1920s. I think it was B.O. Dodge that uh, brought it into scientific, uh, the scientific world, it's great for genetics. Here, it grows as what's called a filament, filamentous fungus. Um, and then here's a close-up of one of the filaments, a branch point, and you can see these septa that go across. So it's sort of like it has individual cells, but there are pores in the septa and the cytoplasm, the stuff, the nuclei in the cytoplasm, the stuff in the cells, can flow freely through there. So it's not like your regular cell that we tend to think of like our cells. Most of them are a single cell with a single nucleus in it. These are, um, uh, yes, the word just escaped me. But the muscle cells in our legs, for example, and actually everywhere, I guess, are also syncytiums like these, where they have, they're long and thin and they have multiple nuclei. So this isn't the only place in the world that grows this way. So this is their vegetative growth here. Down here, oh, oh the green is all the nuclei, okay, that's stained with a green dye. And then down here is shown um, the sexual um, cycle. This is the, there's a sac, a 
uh, parathesium that grows all these, um, that has the uh, sexual spores enclosed, in, encased in long, thin tubes. And there's a, was many, many years of clock and light regulated um, research has been done on Neurospora. So we knew that asexual conidiation, like I told you in the past, circadian rhythms was under circadian control. We also knew that the um, parathesium that encloses these asco sacs that have the sexual spores in them, they bend towards the light, but they also have a circadian aspect to their development. If you um, get rid of the clock, they still develop, but there are some problems in their movements. Um, and pigmentation. Uh, pigmentation is both under light control and circadian clock control, and we have many different mutants in pigmentation. Okay, so um, back in the late 60s and early 70s, there were two guys, Jerry Feldman and Ron Kanaka, who were both at Caltech. Jerry was a postdoc, Ron was a graduate student, they were in different labs. Jerry uh, was working with Norm Horvitz on Neurospora, and he decided to mutagenize Neurospora and see if he could get changes in this periodicity of the asexual spores growing along these glass tubes on medium. And you see that he isolated both short and long period mutants. So if you look at this one where I put a little dot in the middle of the where it's making the spores, and then you look at this tube down here, you can see that there these um, uh, spores are occurring at different times during the day. And they have different period lengths. Actually, that's more accurate than different times during the day, but they do have different period lengths. And here's a very long one. This is Freak 7, it has a 29 hour period. Freak Plus at 22, Freak 2 at 19, I think. Okay, when Jerry was doing this, as I said, there was this graduate student, Ron Kanaka, um, and they were friends and colleagues who was doing the same thing using fruit flies. And he was measuring eclosion rhythms, which is the last hatch of a pupa into an adult fruit fly. Okay, and here's wild type, which I think is close to 24 hours. He also found an arrhythmic, as did Jerry down here. Um, and then he found a short period and a long period. And uh, it was found that all of these mapped to one place in the fruit fly genome, all of these map to one place in the Neurospora genome. Okay, so now I'm gonna talk about, in just a couple of slides, our work. Uh, Jay and I have worked together for, I think we've run a lab together for 36 years. It's sort of, a, I mean, we have separate labs, but we also, it's a combined, especially now, we run it as a combined operation. Okay, we picked Neurospora as our organism. Um, as I said, it's a highly tractable model for research, for genetic research. And I've introduced you to the race tubes here. Um, we can take pictures or scans of these race tubes. And then we have algorithms where we can track when these spores peak and when the growth doesn't have spores. Um, and that's the historical assay. We did not develop this assay, but we've developed some cool fun tools along the way. And this is one of them here. Ah, we've placed uh, firefly luciferase under the regulatory parts of a gene that is rhythmic. So we call those regulatory parts that cause a gene to be expressed, the promoter, and it allows us to monitor the clock. So this down here at the bottom is a picture of one of those race tubes that I'm showing you. This is a race tube and this is a race tube. But this is, uh, we have a camera in the incubator, a uh, very specific high sensitivity camera that's seeing the luciferase being expressed at some times of day and not the other. And what that gives us is rhythms, output rhythms, as shown here, 
and you can see that we have two different strains that I'm showing you here with different period lengths. The orange one is much longer than the blue one. We can also um, put our organism into the wells of what's called a 96 well plate. They're not very big. And so they just get a couple mils. Let me see now, where's my movie? Of media, and then we inoculate them. And we can put them under the same sensitive camera and watch them go up and down. So these tools and others that we have developed had allowed us to then map the genes of various genetic mutants, including many of Jerry's, um, clone them, and get sequence from them. Okay, the first gene that was mapped and cloned for us was frequency. And we turned out to be a big gene for a fungal gene. It had a thousand amino acids and we gazed and gazed at this sequence and back 30 some years ago, it told us absolutely nothing. <laughs> there wasn't a single identifiable thing to this sequence. And uh, of course we know a lot more about genes, but it still sort of doesn't have a lot of identifiable sequence. So, um, let's see, after some years of frustration, we figured out how to look at its RNA and um, protein that was being made from this gene of this big um, sequence that didn't tell us anything, and we found that they were rhythmic. Okay, so this was a very early finding of uh, rhythmicity in transcription. This is an RNA, and I'll tell you a little bit about RNA in the next slide, and then the protein that is made from the RNA. So what we found is that we were seeing, this is over the course of two days. So that means some graduate student or postdoc is getting up every three hours mm -hmm. and harvesting a sample and turning it into either protein or RNA that they can later run on a gel. These are different types of gels where we have separated things. And we found that we got molecular oscillations in quantity and also in quality of the protein. And that's, I'm not gonna talk about that today, but it's, that's been very um, useful in our understanding how frequency works. Okay, so we finally knew something, they were rhythmic, and that made us think about the central dogma of molecular biology. And I think a number of you have heard about this, maybe from Barry, um, and it suggested to us a model for a feedback oscillator. So here you have your DNA, your genome, made out of the uh, four base pairs that in super long, um, uh, <laughs> I'm just having a terrible time with the words today, um, uh, the strings and chromosomes, but long strings of these four base pairs. And that's your, that's your genome in your DNA. Short regions of this DNA, the genes, can be converted to RNA. Um, and so you, now you have short uh, pieces of similar, but not exactly the same, nucleic acids. Um, and this is called RNA and we're, yeah, we're not gonna go. And this, so this is transcription between DNA and turning it into RNA. That's transcription. Taking RNA and turning it into protein is called translation. Um, which um, Harry Noller at UCSC, many of you may know, um, has spent his life working on and uh, won a number of prizes. Um, and these are chains of amino acids. Okay, so we thought, well, if we had something like Freak and we called it a clock gene because we can change it, we can mutagenize it and get clocks of different period lengths, that's our DNA. It gets turned into a clock messenger RNA that then is translated into clock protein, if that clock protein frequency fed back and blocked the activity of its own gene somehow, we would have a feedback oscillator, a negative feedback loop. And if you built in delays, you could make it 
24 hours. So that's the basis of where we went from there. So this is my final um, research slide. Um, I'm gonna give you like 35 years of our research in one slide here. So we found that we got Freak and it works, it, they work as um, a dimer, a homodimer. Two of them, after they're made, these are the proteins, work together. We then went on to find the transcription factor that sits on the frequency DNA and turns it into messenger RNA that then allows it to be translated into protein. Okay, and we found the transcription factors. There were two different transcription factors, so, and they act as a heterodimer. So we call these the positive elements because they promote the expression of frequency, which are, we call the negative element complex. Uh, past postdoc of ours, E. Liu, who's in Dallas, his lab, identified frequency interacting helicase, which is necessary for the activity of this complex. Oops. And the whole thing feeds back after it's made and assembled. There are many delays in here, but it feeds back and binds these transcription factors and stops them from activating the frequency gene. So this is our daily transcription, translation, feedback oscillator. That's about 24 hours in Neurospora. We have also, once we had these transcription factors in hand, we knew from the work of others that if, you, if they were mutated, then the fungus was blind. So we thought, mm, well, what if it's involved in the light regulation? We know the clocks see light somehow and are entrained by them. And sure enough, it turns out, we showed that these transcription factors here bind what's called a chromophore, just like the opsins in your retina, which allows detection of a photon of light. And that, cha there. that changes their conformation and they become active, even at times of day when they may be blocked. Then this, the negative part goes away and they are active and they, that produces an immediate uh, bolus of the frequency freak interacting helicase complex. And what that means is that it changes the amount of this negative element. And that results in resetting of the phase of the clock. So in this way, we figured out how clocks, and it turns out that your mammalian clock is reset very much like the Neurospora clock. So this has been a great model system to inform us how um, more complex systems work. We also, and this was early on, I'm not really showing you this in chronological order, but found that these transcription factors promoted rhythmicity in other genes in the organism. Not too many, about 50, but other genes that were turned on, and you can see them being, this is a replicates of a single gene here um, that are made in a time of day specific manner, but they don't have, when you knock them out, they don't have anything to do with the clock. They have things to do with metabolism and development and things like that. So they're the output. Um, and here in this blue and yellow, this is called a heat map. And you see them a lot in science these days because this is, this heat maps came out of big data. We have so many methods that produce enormous amounts of data. And this is a method here that I'm showing you that gives us the expression patterns of every gene that's being expressed in the genome. So in this particular heat, I mean, we, and we have, not quite 10,000 genes in Neurospora, but in this particular heat map, we're only looking at the rhythmic ones. And this is showing probably, I don't know, six or eight or 900 genes going this way. So each little row along here is a gene. Okay, yellow means that the gene is on, uh, blue means the gene is off. So if you look at this little cluster here, these cluster of genes, like 100 genes, is on in the morning, off 
in the evening. On again the next morning, off in the evening. And you can see that not all the genes in the organism are in the, are in the same phase. You also have genes that are on in the evening, off in the morning. Okay, so the whole architecture of this transcription translation feedback loop has been conserved into mammals. Many, there is conservation in the transcription factors and in many of the um, accessory proteins like kinases uh, uh, and proteins that turn these things over when we don't need them in the cell anymore. There's been a lot of conservation there. The sequence for these things has not been so highly conserved, but the entire molecular architecture is conserved with mammals. Plants are crazy complex, um, and they it's hard to say how much evolutionary conservation there, there is there or how much they just did it on their own. Um, plants, of course, circadian rhythms are incredibly important because you know when you see a predator coming or whatever, or the sun over there, you can't get up and walk over there or run away. Um, and I guess that's all I need to say. Now I'm going to close with showing you our um, evolutionary tree, as it were, our family tree, in that, um, of course, Jay and I didn't do all this work. Um, it was the people that worked with us that we were lucky enough to bring into our lab and work with. And this picture at the base of the tree is um, our daughter, uh, who is now 34. And this picture was taken on Rusty and Barry's deck overlooking Santa Cruz, obviously 34 years ago. And I'm gonna show you some of the people that um, have come, most of the people that have come into the lab, except that I haven't updated this for about five years, so I really need to, there are still a lot more people. But we've just been so lucky to work with so many terrifically talented people. Um, now you're gonna see groups of somewhat smaller pictures appear next to um, people that have come from our lab. So that's Deb Bell Peterson here, who's at Texas A&M, and she was my first postdoc. And now these are all the people that she has trained, and some of them, like Zach Lewis, has gone on and are working with Neurospora. Oops. Okay, so these are a lot of the people that are our people have trained. So in other words, we have grandchildren. <laughs> and I will say that this has been the most satisfactory part of my um, career and my life, I think, is uh, science is where you get to choose your family. And it has been um, really a wonderful thing. And another picture from up here by Lisa Cass. And then if I can figure out Ah, oh, how to stop sharing. That worked. I'm, I'm done. Yep. Well, that, that was, yeah. that was superb, Jennifer. Thank you. Thank you so much. And, and let me say uh, to the group that in that last slide, if you thought that was complicated, it's just the tip of the iceberg <laughs> that, that Jay and Jennifer have figured out. It's one of the more intricate and due to them, one of the best studied systems in biology. All right, so we have some time for some questions. And I'm uh, sorry I took so much time. I thought I was gonna end about 10 minutes ago. Jennifer, was... Jennifer, no problem. <laughs> Good. Okay, I feel okay. badly. Good. So if you have a question, raise your hand or I can question, I can uh, call on you and, and you can unmute yourself. Pat McVeigh. Yes, back to your um, medication uh, <laughs> administration. Would that apply also for supplements? Yes, and we have no idea. So, so that was one of the, I gave you two examples, the medications and the immunity um, yeah. that are really new areas. Things that are only 10 years old are really new areas of scientific research, but that's, that's a marvelous point. And, you know, I hadn't thought about that, but they might, and it probably depends on the supplement, but Right, right. But of course, it depends on what you want them to be doing and what their targets are in your body. Good, good question. Somebody needs to study. 
<laughs> well, yes. Yeah. So, okay. So, so, you know, next time somebody talks about your tax paying, your taxpayer money going to the NIH, support <laughs> that. <laughs> All right. Uh, other question, questions here. Uh, okay. Uh, Joya, uh, unmute yourself. Yeah. Uh, no, you are not right. I, I see you. Yeah. Joya is still muted. Uh, should be on your, your bottom. Just, just right. hold the space bar down. There we go. Got it. Disappeared. Oh, there she is. Yeah. Um, so my question is, um, what happens to the rhythm in, say, for people who live above the Arctic Circle? I was thinking <laughs> about that. You know, because the, the days and nights sort of kind of go longer. Oh, you are absolutely right. And so basically they live in dyssynchrony. Now, humans, we've gotten pretty sophisticated. So we now have things like lights in our house. <laughs> and um, so we, and we can detect and entrain to very low levels of light. Um, so that helps. But you're right that it is a major issue. I don't, I can't think of any um, health studies that have been done and how it might affect. In other words, you know, are there cancer rates um, higher? Because they certainly are in stewards on planes. Um, a study in um, women stewardesses one of these big women's studies have shown that they get breast cancer at a much higher rate than the general population. That's a great question. I don't know. People have worked, there's a guy who worked on big Arctic mammals, uh, like reindeer, um, that, and the basically during, what was it, during the midsummer and the midwinter, when it was just simply dark all the time or light all the time, their clocks were sort of um, not working anymore. It's as if they just didn't, mm -hmm. and who knows how they feel, whether they feel like they have daylight. <laughs> I don't know. Good question. Yeah, thank you. Like I'm dreading the daylight savings time going yes. back. And um, I really am, because it's mm -hmm. just, yeah. So that's Well, you I'm know, saying. there are um, lights that you can buy on the internet. Just Google this and, Maybe look for, you know, uh, the ones that get the best reviews where if you really are prone to this, it's called seasonal affective disorder. And you can actually sit with these lights close to your face, like for 30 minutes every morning when you get up, maybe when you're having your coffee, because some people are much more prone to seasonal affective disorder than other people. I'm one of them. And we moved into this house that I'm showing you right now that has a lot of windows in it made a huge difference in my life. Um, and, and it helps because it's part of your circadian regulation. You're not getting enough light and you feel like you've got jet lag. You feel depressed and horrible. Thank you. Okay. Maybe a couple more here. Uh, let's see. We got Richard. Unmute yourself. Here we go. <clears throat> uh, I found this a really fascinating uh, topic. Um, I'm, was in the Air Force for 20 years on board certified aerospace medicine, so I see the, the body clock as a human factor in, in performance. Um, and I actually knew Hubertus Strukhold, who wrote the first book, I believe, about your body clock and jet lag uh, back in the days when rapid transfer from across many time zones left you uh, at the other end of your trip uh, possibly mentally befuddled. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that at the time was a concern uh, with diplomats traveling rapidly and then having a meeting as soon as they step off the airplane after crossing umpteen time zones. So it's, it's still an important consideration in human factors in, in the real world. Yeah, that's, so this is a perfect comment. I don't know if you saw Richard in my First slide where I had the, my funding sources up there. The one at the bottom was the United States Air Force. I did that notice was, that. 
<laughs> yeah, so some of the most fun funding I've ever had. They supported me for maybe six years and they gave me a lot of money. And this was to work on a fungus. Now, they still support people that work on humans and whatnot, but this was a very, I think, far-seeing and sophisticated program manager. And that was the, it was under that funding that we discovered how light reset the clock. And that wasn't known for any system, and it was really important and really big. And, and they'd fly us once a year out to um, Colorado to the Air Force Academy there, and it was always very interesting. We'd all meet and talk science, and then we'd all have these generals come in like before dinner or something and give us lectures on how they wanted their fighting men. How do you fill up a transport plane with people in great shape, drop them on the other side of the world, and have them get off the plane ready at peak physical and mental performance? Which, of course, we still don't know, but we know a lot more than we did. There are some things that you can do, but one of the best things you can do is give them a couple of days to reset their clocks. <laughs> but things like light dark cycles in, in the new place can help a lot. Hmm. Thank you. Okay, other, other question. Got any, anybody else here? Yes, Catherine. Yes. I have a question. Um, Jennifer, has anyone, I know that the yogis have a way of, um, a, 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 a cycle of when to do, when it's optimum to do different things in one's life and, and in one's day. And I wonder if there's ever been any, um, I don't know, cross fertilization of science oh, and uh, this ancient art of uh, meditation and yogi and yoga practices. I like that idea. I don't know of any of us doing that. Um, you know, any scientists that work on biological clocks and chronobiology actually doing that, but it actually sounds, you know, I did yoga for years until my joints said, no, you can't. And, <laughs> and so that, that's a good, I, you know, that's interesting because that's it. There is so much um, wisdom that people have developed from observing the natural world and observing themselves. And I wouldn't be at all surprised if there were a lot of things that, you know, would align there, that you do some things at some times a day, like when you're most energetic, when you're at peak physical performance, mm -hmm. um, when you're at peak mental performance. Yeah, it's, that's, that's a very interesting idea. Thank you. Jennifer? Go ahead. Hello. Yeah, there is uh, something in Chinese medicine, which might be what you're talking about, in which they say that at different times of the day, you have different parts of your body that are most active. And so yeah. they'll say the liver has its time and the kidneys and so on through the body. So that might be similar to what you're discussing. <laughs> well, yes. Uh, ours, of course, is based on scientific research and evidence that has been built up but that doesn't but the chinese of course have been doing science for many millennia and they're you know as a population extremely smart and so i wouldn't be surprised okay uh i see bill has got his hand up yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> planting crops by the light of the moon <laughs> right there you go although Ah, there are, that's a whole different, so those aren't 24-hour rhythms. Those are lunar rhythms, and there is, there are people that work on lunar rhythms. There are tidal creatures that go through cycles that have, obviously, um, women's menstrual cycles. There you go. So, um, but I don't, you know, it's not my area of expertise. <laughs> okay. Uh, one, so, Susan? Now, I just have a, a quick uh, travel comment. I know my son, as a as a as a uh, competing Olympic athlete, always tried when he was competing in Europe or Asia to go at least a week in advance. Yep, good idea. For competitions, so it must be terrible for people who are who are flying all over all the time. But because for for world competition and Olympics, you can plan a lot in advance. 
But if you're playing a, te playing a tennis tournament this week in, in China and next week in Rome and the third week in New York, I mean, you must, I don't know how they ever do that. So, in fact, some years ago, our, our colleague and friend Bill Schwartz uh, did some analysis on this. I think this was baseball teams. And he found that you could predict winning based on who had to travel and over who, how many time zones and how long the teams had to rest before they had to play. And there are smart bookmakers out there who <laughs> have figured out how to add this into the odds for sports teams. <laughs> okay. Well, maybe maybe we're, we should wrap it up. It's 10 after 12. Uh, Benita, you have any yes. words for us? No, I just thank everybody for coming. It was really great to see everyone and we'll look forward to seeing you next month, if not before, at one of the classes. So okay. thank you. And thank, you Jennifer. thank you, Jennifer. Thank you, Jennifer. Thank you for listening for so long. <laughs> it was our pleasure. Okay. All right.